Real Moving Voices, the first time in English. Real Moving Voices uh, was initiated by my colleague Matthias and me, Alexander. We are both filmmakers and we used to make um, documentaries or we are still making documentaries and of course documentaries are based on interviews and most of our interviews have been long but have been cut down to three minutes or whatever and uh, we are really happy to have found um, this this channel this uh, this way of communicating to the to the world uh, through podcast so our conversations are really about the human or or, or the people and and their struggle or their conclusions of life maybe and when you think about that they all in a way always ask the same questions as we do too about how we want to live our lives and how we want our lives to look like well as an individual or as a species we kind of think what are we how are we going to solve the problems of our time climate change and social challenges the media is often full of scary news and we found that there's hope to be found really when talking to people that have an agenda to 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 kind of to really change the world to the better or at least try so and so now in podcast number four we have really found a person that is like that. His name is Karim al Jizr, and he's the sustainability officer of the sustainable city in Dubai. And Dubai is not really a place but that people would associate with, uh, well, let's say solving the problems of climate change or, or social issues. But I don't want to spoil this. This was really a great conversation I had. So, without further ado, here comes our podcast number four, Designing the Cities of the Future. Okay, I'm here with Karim al -Jisir, and he's the sustainability officer of the sustainability city in Dubai, and I'm really thrilled to talk to you. Um, I could start this interview with, with maybe with telling you about what happened to me when I left Germany because I said I'm going to go to Dubai and I'm going to talk about sustainability and they said yeah right everybody <laughs> so, yes and I guess there are a lot of takes people, it seriously yes I think so I think a lot of people think uh, consider Dubai you know to be uh, the center of uh, consumption and you know this this fossil fuel world so what would you reply to Maybe we could start from there. What's, what's the first thing? I would say about? this is precisely why the opportunity is so great here to change the paradigm, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the pendulum is swinging. We mm -hmm. know that because mm -hmm. of climate change, because of economics, uh, because of millennials, uh, because of population growth, etc. So many factors uh, have contributed to this acceleration that we see. Everything is moving so fast and changing so fast. So I would argue that countries with a high carbon footprint and that are fossil based are precisely the same countries that have the greatest potential for change. Mm -hmm. and, and these are the countries that if they swing, you know, from high carbon to low carbon, or from unsustainable to sustainable, uh, then the impact is great on the planet. So um, the challenge is here, you mm -hmm. know, it is, I'm half Danish, mm -hmm. by the way. So mm -hmm. I was brought up in Denmark. I've, you know, to me, Denmark, Danish ways, Scandinavian values, it's, it's, it's in my blood. But being sustainable in Denmark is uh, not very difficult. You know, and uh, whereas being sustainable and practicing a, a sustainable lifestyle is much more challenging in hot countries, in parts of Africa, in Australia, etc. So let's remember the temperature here for about 100 consecutive days exceeds 45 Celsius for 100 consecutive days, 45 degrees, it can hit 50 degrees. So how can you claim, how can you design something that is sustainable? So the challenge is, is here, and that's the opportunity, and that's the excitement that we, that we feel of you know, having designed, well planned, designed, built, and now we operate the first sustainable community, a master community in the GCC. And how do you think it is being perceived in this world right now? Well. So clearly there's been an evolution. I've been here now for four years, uh, but the planning started before I came as well, before I joined the company, Diamond Developers. 
And, uh, but I, I, if I retrace those steps, I need to say, when did this start? So the planning for the sustainable city started during the last financial crisis. Mm -hmm. So it is in times of crisis, and we have a proverb or a saying in Arabic, that in times of need, you really uh, need to think outside the box. Absolutely. And the need was 10 years ago when all these curves, they plummeted, all those financial curves, and the property market imploded. Uh, in many parts of the world and Dubai was affected and this was the time that diamond developers uh, was still committed to complete what was in the pipeline but by 2010 when everything was delivered the market was still stagnant and this is it is precisely in those times that you have to think of the future and about the future and when you're too busy you know when you and I are very very busy every day we don't stop and think about the future I can because so agree. it's it's like a it's like a washing machine. We're just like spinning around or you're on a treadmill all day. But in times of slowdown, this is when you can plot the future. And so we decided to, uh, to travel and to learn from many countries and cities around the world. Where did you travel? So between 2012, uh, mostly in 2012 and 2013, we visited a dozen communities. So we went all the way west to the University of California. They had just announced a new campus um, uh, for their students and staff called West Village. Mm -hmm. That's the University of California in Davis. And there was a lot of focus on social sustainability, a people-centric campus. Then we went all the way east to Fujisawa in Japan. And there it was all about automation and solar, mm -hmm. right? And being mm -hmm. zero energy. So the concept of zero energy was, was drew our attention. And this is what we're trying to apply today. In between those two, we also visited Sonobo in Denmark. They have something called uh, Zero Waste Project. We West visit in, in uh, Copenhagen? Sonobo, or? yeah, so, uh, Sonobo just in okay. Denmark. It's yeah. a community south of Copenhagen. Okay. And then we visited Freiburg in Germany, which is also trying to modernize and bring in sustainability, and it has a lot of cultural significance as well. And then we went to Eden. Uh, we visited the Eden Project in the UK, where you have those large structures where they've recreated ecosystems from around the world inside uh, canopies, you know, uh, controlled environments. And this is the inspiration behind the biodomes that we see in the sustainable city. And then, of course, Mastar City, next door to us. That's just 100 kilometers south of where we are today. Mastar City started in 2005. They had an uptake, but they too hit the global financial crisis. So there were many lessons to be drawn from Mustard City back in 2012. So the world has a lot to offer, and the list is much longer. Uh, you have communities in Egypt, you have communities around the world which claim some form of sustainability. So for us, it was really um, back to school. Mm -hmm. That was 2012. And uh, we were able to capture all the great ideas, all the innovations, all the successes, all the failures of those various uh, endeavors, all these projects and communities that we visited. And what we did was to literally do some cherry picking so that we bring all the great ideas and put them in one space called the Sustainable City in Dubai. But of course, we had to adapt it to the uh, local context, including culture, regulation, climate, right? So if something works in Freiburg, it doesn't necessarily work in Dubai. I would think so. And if it works in Dubai, it may not work in Fujisawa. But certainly there are many common denominators. And I think sustainability is about, if we want to demystify it, if we want to unscramble eggs, because sometimes sustainability seems a bit complex, we can dissect it into three. And in, in my view, it's quite simple. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what I say today. So those three parts that make up sustainability are, you know, the people, the planet and the profit. We say it's about social sustainability, environmental sustainability and economic sustainability. So our business model has completely changed today. Everything we do, everything we've done here in the sustainable city and in future sustainable cities by, by the group will have a social pillar, an environmental pillar and an economic pillar. And when you dissect that further, you get into a social sustainability. All right, as a developer, what do I do? How do I dissect it? How do I provide? How do I achieve social sustainability? In our view, it's about building a sense of community. You know, many communities in the world lack the community feel mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. community factor. Mm -hmm. They're pretty, they're beautiful, they are 
affordable or they're, they're luxurious, but it's, there is no community per se. So how do I achieve a community? And that's not an afterthought. That is something we have to keep in mind from day one as we start with a white canvas and we're designing new cities. Let, let's clarify that we are working in the space of new cities as opposed to existing cities which can be upgraded and renovated and that's happening all over Europe today. But for new cities, India, for example, is planning 500 new cities in the next decade. Saudi Arabia will need a few dozen. Egypt will need perhaps 50, etc. So new cities are here to stay. They are needed because of population growth and because of urbanization. So social sustainability, back to that. For us, it's about building a sense of community. It's about education. Education can be formal, informal, non-formal, community education. And I always say that a sustainable city will attract people with unsustainable behaviors. So it's not enough just to draw people to a sustainable community. You need to educate. Education is ongoing. Even in Denmark, when I used to live there, you have to enforce the good practices, right? And you can be penalized for not following common sense and green practices. So education, education, education. Safety and security is really important to social sustainability. And there is another one which is becoming more and more important to society, and that's inclusion and tolerance. So a sense of community is one thing, but inclusion and tolerance, inclusion of people with different abilities, inclusion of people who speak other languages, tolerance to, you know, between religions, between customs and, 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 and practices. So all of that, as a developer, is something we want to achieve, social sustainability. Why is, this, why, why is inclusion part of the sustainability aspect? Because if you don't provide this space and the mechanisms and the community rules and the incentives uh, of inclusion, chances are you're going to face conflict. And by excluding people, it's going to challenge the sense of community. You might have incidents. Uh, you don't want to have unhappy people. Mm. Uh, I think, you know, cities... Uh, perhaps function well, many cities function well, many cities do not function well, well today, but we have to remember that it's cities for the people. So we, we want to somehow enhance happiness, and happiness is a national agenda. Back to your first question, why the UAE? Well, the UAE is really very progressive. They are thinking decades ahead of their time. Happiness is a national agenda. There is a, this was the first country in the world to establish a ministry of, for happiness. <laughs> so how can you be happy, right? <laughs> it's, you know, we can have a, a very long conversation about it. Yes, yes, and it's can. not you know, down to metrics. Yes. But obviously it's something we want to try yes. to promote and facilitate. I, I didn't want to lead astray too far. Uh, I, I, I get your point. Okay. <laughs> and so. then the second one, environmental sustainability. So how do we, as urban planners and developers, how do we achieve it? So for us, again, we dissected it. So this is our DNA. We have six key industries or themes under environmental sustainability. One is food. We want our cities, our buildings, our parking lots, our basements to produce food and contribute to food security in a German context, in a UAE context, in, a, in, a, in an African context. Any country in the world under any climate can produce food. If it's too cold, you can warm it up. If it's too hot, you can keep it cool. That's where technology comes in and renewable energy. So food security and food production, one. Two, energy management. We have to achieve zero energy developments. Better yet, we can be energy positive. But let's for now say, you know, uh, this is the common denominator, the Paris Agreement, SDG 17, climate action. We have to reduce our carbon footprint by achieving zero energy status within our developments, which means I produce enough electricity from renewable sources to match or offset my consumption on an annual basis. That would be zero energy. Third, and this has to do with demand side management and renewable energy production. Third is water management. Again, whether it's rainwater coming to you or it's desalination or it's groundwater that you're pumping, in all cases, you have to manage the water, you have to uh, treat the wastewater, you have to reuse the treated sewage effluent in the best possible way. Technology can help, but you also need education and common sense. Four, it's about how do we build. The construction industry is progressing, but by and large, the way we build today has been the same for decades. 
and we use too much concrete today and too much steel. Steel and concrete account for a large, large share of global carbon emissions in the world. And so construction de facto is a, a big emitter of greenhouse gases. So we need to innovate. We need to think of other materials using less materials. We need to think of lightweight facades. We need to think of a different construction method. We can obviously bring in timber if it comes from sustainable forests. So Europe, I would say, have the upper hand here because they have access to more resource, natural resources and their supply chain has, has diversified in the, in the last couple of years and decades. In the UAE, we're trying to innovate. Uh, we're very much limited by resources, but this is an area for, uh, great, uh, with great opportunity for change. That's number four. Number five is mobility. So how do we design a sustainable community, a sustainable town or city with sustainable mobility services? Mobility is not just transportation. Mobility is moving from A to B. Whether you are walking, you are biking, you are on an e-scooter, you are in a buggy, you are sharing cars, sharing what have you, drone delivery tomorrow, all of that is part of the equation. And here you can, you can think of... Um, clusters within your cities which are car free that's number one if you like central london or central whatever more and more spaces are becoming car free if you move out you can think of low emission and zero emission and then you can think of low emission so low emission vehicles zero emission vehicles no vehicles right this is how we need to think for sustainable transport and the last one is waste management. So our cities are producing way too much waste, all of us. It's one thing to do sorting and recycling, that's good, but that's not good enough. We need to do much more upstream, which means we need to consume less and we need to throw less. And, and that's back to education and the supply chain. How do we influence the supply chain, but how do we educate our, our end users? So in this community, we do a lot of uh, uh, we, we inspire, I we motivate, I, yeah, I saw that. I we saw nudge. That. I saw the, the canisters that are in we each have, house. Certainly yes. we have all the bins provided yes. to make, because sustainability is about convenience as well. Mm -hmm. We need to make sustainability attractive, cool and convenient. Mm -hmm. If sustainability is like going to school every day and it's, you know, it's about discipline, yes, we have to be disciplined. But if it's only about discipline, we're not going to change yeah. fast enough. Yeah, yeah. And that transition, if we want to accelerate it, we have to you know, derive the cool factor of sustainability. It's got to be fun. It's got to be motivating or self-motivating. And it's got to be commercially viable, obviously. So a lot of education across the board. But everything I mentioned, food security, energy management, water management, building materials, mobility and waste management, all of them have a very technical engineering dimension. Yes. And they also have an IoT. And then they also have a behavioral dimension. People have to change. So when you put it all together, you begin to look like a sustainable community. And then we have the last dimension, economic sustainability. So uh, for us, for, the, for Diamond Developers, our first objective was to demonstrate how to build a sustainable community in a very harsh climate without costing more to the, to the developer and without costing more to the end user, whether investors, homeowners or tenants. And we've demonstrated that, and that's a very complex equation of how you can be competitive even as you increase your building standards, but you have savings, that you incur savings yes. during construction yes, yes, yes. and savings during op living or uh, operation. That all has to go along. So um, I, I, to some of the points that you mentioned, I, would, uh, I, I was just, you know, th that's a topic I'm completely uh, engaged with and that's the cradle to cradle uh, issue, as you know. So I, 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 would, I, I would try to challenge you on that. Is, um, how, how about, uh, first of all, not thinking about waste as waste? Uh, because, you know, um, you've heard of that concept, I'm sure. Right, so what is your answer to, to that? Do you think that is um, far into the future or, um, or, or how is this being possible? In this no, it's, it, it, it is happening, but perhaps we've only seen 1% of what we need to see. So we still have 99% of work yes. uh, to achieve cradle to cradle. Uh, so we have limited finite resources on the planet. We know it. There's a lot of trade and resources being traded across the world, right, to satisfy the needs of communities and construction. 
So how do we demonstrate cradle to cradle? Cradle. So we've, you know, we have, uh, we have simple examples and applications. So over the course of this past summer, during summer, the, the the activity level drops a little bit. You know, we we receive thousands of visitors to Sustainable City every year. When it's hot, it gets really hot, and so this was a time for us to try to revamp our public space. You know, this domain which we call the uh, uh, the farm. In that space, we wanted to create a, um, an outdoor play area, which used literally only resources on site. So we spent three months uh, getting inspired, you know, through Instagram and social media, etc., and coming up with designs that we can build locally. And so what we have, I hope you saw it, mm -hmm. okay. what we have is an animal sanctuary and an outdoor play area made of construction waste. Mm -hmm. All that construction waste was literally behind the fence. Mm -hmm. So rebars and PVC pipes and uh, wood pallets and, and, and what have you. And we now have a very attractive space for kids with giant furniture and lamps and animals inside. These are rescue animals that we have. So this was a demonstration of how to turn construction waste, which is really challenging, into something meaningful. Mm -hmm. So we've repurposed that into and we bring right. in utility value to the That's community. Right, which is recycling at this point, not really... Uh, which, it's not the know, last step. It's not it didn't go back step. to the yeah, cradle yet. And, and, the, and the project uh, and, and, the, and the material itself, of course, has, has still its deficit. But, but I'm fine with that. You know, I, I really, I really uh, admire the, um, uh, everything that, that's been here. I've been on a tour yesterday and I've, I've seen a lot. And, and, and of course, you always look at, at the problems still you know I, I I look at it from an angle as well when I'm when I'm here when I go through the shopping malls and I see all the you know all the plastic everywhere all the consumption everywhere I, I see okay we are not there yet but every True. step that's going in the right direction is what what I believe is uh, is a good step and uh, and so I think I would like to to talk to you about the philosophical aspect of, of this so what you're building here in a way is is then a, a, an example uh, for how to build a city in hot areas is, that's what you're doing basically right how what about cold areas uh, yeah <laughs> how about cold areas well I, I guess there are some other people working on that <laughs> I, I yeah don't know. no here's here's what I think um, and here's what I say so now we have almost 10 years of, of experience and of knowledge you know, four years of planning, about three years of, of building, and now about two to three years of operating such a community. And we have a lot of data coming in, some of them here behind me on that screen. So we have uh, data streams coming to us to understand and quantify sustainability. So today the result is a proof of concept, as you said. It's an example. We have 3,000 people living here, 46 hectares, etc. And I say it's, it's a working model of what a, a sustainable community can look like or may look like but it's only a drop in the ocean, right? It's only a drop. So we need, we need a ripple effect, you know? How can we create that wave? Yes. And people begin to copy, yes. get inspired, because everything we've done here, it's, we have an open book policy. Mm -hmm. uh, we've received all our competitors, if we have them, you know, in the construction industry, government entities, corporates, NGOs, nonprofits, etc. cetera. Um, Today, this morning, we had visitors from Bosch, and then we had visitors from a Japanese company, and so on and so forth. Yes. So that's that's great. So your question is, so how where is do we go? go? How is the change going to happen? How so is this going to happen on the large scale? So we, we have been solicited um, by my, many, many dozens and dozens of entities around the world, either... And I'm just explaining facts, you know, yes, and yes, we yes, were learning. Ahead. So we've been approached, solicited by uh, land owners or land banks by ministries of housing, public housing, social housing. We've been approached by sovereign wealth funds, you know, the equivalent of investment funds in various countries or investment instruments. We've been approached by other developers, we've been approached by corporates, and we've been approached simply by investors who have money that they want to invest into some sustainable real estate uh, property or assets. And um, over the past two years, we have started conversations with more than 12 entities, perhaps 15 entities. And we now recently launched our second community, our second project in Sharjah. Mm -hmm. And after that, we're looking at other regional countries. We're looking at Europe. We have some very hard pipeline uh, commitments in Europe as well. In the Far East, we looked at Australia, Western Africa, and in the US as well. 
so clearly us as one company we're only again a drop in the ocean we will inshallah as we say uh, we will uh, replicate emulate this development and the philosophy behind it in many countries i would say at least half a dozen countries in the next 10 years but that's not enough right so then we need to be seen and we need to inspire others to do the same and do better right it's it's a journey we can always always do better so i can i can come to you today and say well uh, the villas in the sustainable city uh, consume only one third of the energy that any equivalent villa in the UAE consumes. That's the energy use intensity. And that's great, but we can do better, right? We can reduce that energy use intensity even further. So sustainable sustainability, in my opinion, is a moving target. You can always reduce your emission, consume less, enhance wellness, uh, make people happier, right? You know, these are moving targets. So how do we do more of this? So we have our resources, but we need to multiply that by 1,000 <laughs> to, to change the world and the course yeah, of yes. the planet and the Paris Agreement and the emissions. We call that the emissions curve. And so for that to happen, what we can do is inspire. We can meet and, and speak at the right functions around the world. So we've been invited to some high profile events. And as a last, as a legacy, you know, what can we leave behind and accelerate that narrative and the conversation and the learning? We have one more building coming here behind us in the sustainable city. We have 25,000 square meters allocated for an institute. Yes, and that institute is our commitment to the future. So, you know, we can sell all the rest, but the institute is not something we sell. The institute is where we can enhance learning. We can facilitate research we can incubate sustainability startups we can host conferences events and provide professional training and that institute we hope will be a carbon neutral facility and this is our contribution to uh, mankind okay. so we, we shall see yeah i see so. i see you're, you're 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 a person that is really on an agenda you know it's not about uh, questioning a lot about what you're doing and, and why because i mean and, and neither do i it's the same with, with my with our company you know we're promoting this we're thinking this is you know this is the only way to go so i'm exactly. completely on your side it's the only way to go well, well i, I don't think no there's no sense. argument left no, and argument you know the left. the cold versus the hot country etc mm -hmm. to me this is this is a detail because if we agree that you know sustainability in the built environment you know we we still haven't spoken anything about the oceans and the forest no. but if the cities are going to be more sustainable then we have to follow this um uh this structure that i just you know presented before about we need to address food security in the cities we need to address energy we need to address water etc etc yeah. and then you have these cross-cutting layers that i mentioned iot and robotics etc and behavior change but if we all agree that those are the themes that must be addressed to make cities more livable then uh, be it in a cold country in Canada or in a hot country in the GCC, we can still achieve sustainability. Yeah, well, I guess the plan is going to force us to do to act that way even you know faster and faster. Much faster, so, much faster. So, how's how's your personal life come to the sustainable world? How did that? Oh, how did natural, that happen? a very natural journey. So, okay. I studied. Uh, I grew up in Denmark, as I yes. mentioned. So c clearly, I I've been growing food since I was a kid and. Uh, you know, recycling and all of that and, and biking to school is, is second nature to many people in Europe, not yes. just in Denmark. So and then I returned to my home country, which is Lebanon, and I studied agriculture engineering. So I'm an engineer, although I'm not farming today. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I studied env environmental sciences and worked 20 years for a consultancy based in Lebanon with offices in Africa and Washington. And we worked in development, you know, sustainable development, rural development, responsible tourism, conservation, protected areas. And after 20 years, I ran out of steam because I was, and that's, you know, from the mid nineties, I ran out of steam because I thought, and I felt that we were losing battles every day. So for every 10 battles, you win one, you lose nine. Mm -hmm. At least that's, that's what, that was my experience as a consultant. And so I had too much. <laughs> and then I met the, uh, the uh, founder and the, uh, and the CEO of this company, Diamond Developers. And he said something about the sustainable city. And I, I saw a scaled model and I was like, OK, Karim, this is the time. This is, this is the opportunity. Cross the line, you know, cross this invisible barrier between conservation and development. Since I'm not happy on the left side, let me swing over to the right side. Join, I wanted to join the people that I was fighting 
urbanization, building roads, emissions, you know, construction, all, all everything that I saw as bad, bad to the natural world. And so I joined this company, which has a vision, clearly a different vision uh, of the future. And uh, I, uh, before joining the company, I actually decided with my family, I have, I have my wife and my two boys, to live in this community. So we, we actually decided to live in, in Dubai, and I still didn't have a job. I was based in Lebanon. And then eventually I, I met, the, uh, as I mentioned, the, the CEO. And, uh, and that job came very naturally, is to, uh, to establish the institute and, and today to become the chief sustainability officer for a company which wants to build sustainable communities. What a wonderful turn. And so, so uh, I, I think it was very natural. I think I was meant to be here. And I, uh, so I've been here for four years and I've seen the evolution as well. You know, new cities, yes, you can draw it on a map. They look pretty. You know, you, now you do, you've got virtual reality. You can literally visualize a city before you even build it. But ultimately, you have to live in a city and see how it grows, talk to people. Many ideas are generated by the people. So it's, you know, the people come with sometimes better ideas on how to manage a community or how to upgrade a community. And I think it's important. These are some of the lessons, right? Uh, there's only so much you can do as an urban planner and a builder. But if you start right, a city can grow can grow and uh, into something even better. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to, to, to bring this on a very personal level, like from, from, from people listening and questioning themselves, okay, how is this going to happen in the world? What can I do? You know, not everyone is living in a sustainable city. Most people are living in, you know, the, 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 how, I mean, how's, how's your view when you walk through, through Dubai City, which, which to me is, 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 is growing in such a fast speed that I think, uh, is anybody thinking about, you know, what we are now talking about here? I mean, it, it, it appears not really. It appears like this is still a, a small project. And, um, and I think so a lot of people that have the consciousness about the fact that things have to change feel frustrated about what they can do. And then they fall back into their personal lives and say, oh, well, nothing is happening. And, you know, I'm, I'm here uh, in Dubai often because I have family here. And uh, and I I've, I've you know I after a few years I, I stopped to, to to look at things critically because it, it, it I, I I said you know I it obviously is not it's not it's not part of the agenda and I hadn't heard of sustainability city and now I all of a sudden I hear of sustainability city I come here I've, I've I'm completely thrilled uh, my family here has heard of sustainability city but has never even been here. And, uh, and, and I, I, I really wonder what can we bring to the people that really want to, to, to do a change and, and, what can, and, and, and how is this going to, to get hold of the people where, or for example, yesterday I was in Global World, you know, Global, Global World, Village, Global Village where, you know, where you just see all these families from, from I would say, Indian background. All or over the world. Background. And it's just, you know, it's, it's a big temple of consumption where, where everybody is streaming in. You're talking about happiness, which is interesting because I think uh, maybe that they are, they are there. They are somehow trying to to find more answers to that goal of the people here in that area. Because it, it appeared like people are very happy there, you know, con uh, consuming, eating, uh, having having fun. But but then again, how how when are, when are these people going to to be part of it? I'm, I'm sure you've, you've, you've thought about that uh, yourself. <laughs> I think every day we, we learn something, but uh, let's start with the big picture. Yeah. So uh, it's top down, it's bottom up, it doesn't matter. Uh, so uh, you started by saying that this is so unsustainable the way we live in Dubai, which is true. And I said, this is the opportunity to change, to change radically and to see an impact. And so I'll give you a few examples. So when this country decides to uh, accelerate renewable energy and to catch up with countries like Germany, there is leadership and vision behind it. And then there is know-how, and then there is innovation, and then there is implementation, and then you see the result. So we're now sitting in the sustainable city with seven megawatt peak of electricity. And I'm looking at my phone right here. Mm -hmm which is my smart app, <laughs> which shows the energy performance of, of my home today. And today it's now uh, 7, 6 p.m. in the evening, so there's no more sun outside. And so the PV modules on my rooftop produce 20 kilowatt hour, and my consumption from midnight has been 13. So I'm an energy positive villa. Mm -hmm. And I will remain, I will continue to be energy positive all the way through March. And then the air conditioning picks up and then you become deficit. 
to me, this bring me hap- brings me happiness. So we want to multiply this. We want thousands and hundreds of thousands of, of homes to experience this. So I, I was saying that when this country decides to go renewable energy, and they have a certain timeline to achieve it, it's 20 kilometers east of where we are right now. You have the largest, one of the largest solar farms being built in the desert. It is impressive. So that's, that's going to put a dent to the energy equation. 20 kilometers from here? 20 kilometers east of where we are. Okay. It's called the Muhammad bin Rashid Solar Park. I okay. can show it to you on Google Earth, and it's, it's, it's impressive. It's happening as we speak. You don't see it. It's out of sight. It doesn't mean it's out of mind. Mm-hmm. It's just far away, right? And that's going to completely... Um, Uh, change the energy mix of Dubai and the UAE. Let me give you another example. Plastics. We've been talking about plastics heavily in the in the media for the past two, three years, I would say, four years. Ocean plastics, etc. Microplastics in the animals, in what we in the food that we eat, etc. And now suddenly everybody uh, agrees or thinks that plastic is the biggest en- enemy. Of course, the enemy, I would say, is, I would argue, is consumption. But, you know, if plastic is out there, can we avoid it and minimize it? Well, this country, and what you saw at Global Village, is obviously, you know, consumerism is a big problem. But take Dubai airports, so many institution, uh, institutions, again, top-down, from leadership down to how do we phase out single-use plastics and other plastics. So if you take Dubai airports, they have declared that as of January 1st, that's in seven days or eight days, you, there will no longer be any single-use plastic in the airport. Dubai airports, we're talking about, is it 50 million, I think, passengers per year or 60 million? So can you imagine the impact? That's a massive impact. But you need to bring it all the way down to Global Village and to our communities and the malls and the supermarkets. So I think if you have momentum, if you have momentum, people begin to realize that they also have to follow suit. Mm-hmm. And then it becomes mainstream. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Eventually, you will be shamed for not being part of the transition, mm-hmm. right? And then all the way down to people. So how can people make a difference? And are, again, it's becoming easier by the day to m- make decisions or take decisions that will make you more sustainable and reduce your ecological footprint. Not just energy footprint, ecological footprint. Waste, food, food waste, plastics, and so on and so forth. Transportation and cars. So. Technology is helping us become more sustainable. Let's take mobility, for example. Even in a country which is very much road-based, road-centric in Dubai, there are many alternatives now to uh, owning your private car. You have uh, ride-sharing services, you have the e-scooters. We are now introducing an electric vehicle uh, sharing program for the residents of the sustainable city. Uh, We're we're ready, but we're waiting for a piece of paper, a regulation (laughs) to allow us to do it. But anyway, let's put that piece of paper aside. So we're deploying electric vehicles to this community only. So 3,000 residents, say 1,000 drivers. And uh, through their smart app, they will have access to an electric car. And they don't have to worry about license and registration and, 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 and all the rest. And they will experience you know, that beauty and, and the thrill of driving electric with no engine sound and no emissions. Extremely reliable. And today, you know, range anxiety doesn't exist anymore. You can do 500 kilometers Mm -hmm, on one charge. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So these things are happening. Mm -hmm. Of course, I will say not fast enough. We need to multiply everything by 10. And there is an agenda here in Dubai to accelerate everything. There's something called 10x. 10x is really the slogan of the ruler of Dubai. Everything we do, we need to do it 10 times faster. 10x. And so the sustainable city is one big community living laboratory, right? It's Mm -hmm. a laboratory for doing all sorts of things that promote sustainability. But Dubai has really positioned itself, even in tourism, uh, to be a sustainable venue, a sustainable destination. They have a lot of work to do. I'm looking forward to seeing that, yeah. And we uh, we need to do our bit. And we need to bring in... And Dubai, you know, likes to be in the middle of many crossroads. So you have a flow of people coming to Dubai, short stay, long stay, and people come with ideas as well, right? Mm-hmm. It's all, it's not everything is generated within Dubai, but D- Dubai provides a space to, to innovate, uh, to push the boundaries, to challenge status quo, and, uh, and, and, and push this society closer to sustainability. 
Does it have to do with um, uh, uh, with the Arab world? I'm saying that because uh, because uh, Michael Braungart, who, who we happen to follow with Cradle to Cradle a lot, when he uh, started to to develop his idea of Cradle to Cradle, he went in to see many cultures, and he realized that uh, that you know, like China, for example, has a very strong um, tradition actually in 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 uh, recycling uh, materials. I mean, it, it's, it has been that tradition before. They have grown so quickly and uh, with with a lot of uh, downsides to it, as we see, as we know. But uh, but then he's also been in South America, and you know he he said that there, that only if we learn from each cultural tradition, we will be able to 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 find a good solution. What 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 do you think is there in the Arabian tradition and culture that where sustainability uh, would probably could learn from or what, what it could it take from there is there anything i'm just brainstorming yeah here. no good question you know when we when we waste is very much uh, dependent on market mechanisms and forces you have a lot of fantastic waste recycling in egypt for example so it's very much market driven and perhaps also in in those communities or parts of china so there is there's a very strong commercial and a, perhaps also a cultural dimension so your question is about the outer world you know what what do we historically or philosophically or culturally yes. contribute to sustainability so i would say the value of water first of all Water is so precious uh, because we have so little water in many Arab countries, not all <coughs> Arab countries, mm -hmm. but certainly in the GCC where we are very much dependent on desalination. So no desalination means we cannot live here. Uh, if we just go back 100 years, the population in Dubai was perhaps 50,000 people. We're now at 2.5 million. And, uh, and 90% of them are expats who come, who seek Dubai because of jobs and opportunity and quality of life. Likewise, in Abu Dhabi and other uh, other Emirates, so I think the value of water uh, to humanity, to society, to farming, I think is really critical. Two, um, you know, we have ways. Uh, there's a lot, there's a lot of giving in the Arab culture, mm -hmm. uh, and giving is important if we think also waste reduction. Whether you give food or you give clothes or you give unutilized uh, toys and books and, uh, and, and what have you. Uh, that's very much in, in line or aligned with what we call today a circular economy, right? It's yes. about circular flows, eventually cradle to cradle, as you said. But, you know, giving back is something that is very much entrenched in, in Arab uh, hospitality and culture. And as I said, the value of, of water. Um, what else do, do we say? I would say openness. Well, Dubai, Dubai, and the UAE, and you know, before that, I, you know, countries like Lebanon and others, where I'm, I'm half Lebanese, uh, have always been extremely open to East and West, and uh, and that's why you have such a diversity in Dubai. Uh, we have 64 nationalities in the sustainable city. You have 200 nationalities represented in Dubai. So how do 64 nationalities coexist in 46 hectares? with all their habits and customs and expectations and cultural values. So this is clearly a, an experiment, you know, and, mm. uh, and so far a working model of, of coexistence. So I think that's a third also important dimension of uh, Arab uh, culture and philosophy. Yes, yes, I think you're right. Well, so when we look at, uh, at the, um, the, the way of life, and when we think about reduction, very often uh, that people need to, you, you've, you've said, you, you say there still has to be reduction. But how can we ask that from countries like, well, many Arab countries, many, many emerging countries in the world where they still, I mean, they, they just want to get, want to be part of, of a lifestyle that we are all living. Of consumption. And, yeah, of consumption. And I mean, we are living that, and 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 in us in the, in 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 Europe and in, in the Western world, we you know where we have the luxury. And not not everyone there as well, but mo many people there have the luxury of even asking that question. You know, what can I reduce? Where, where can I do less? Um, is that is that is that really a working concept? If we, if, if we have to work with reduction as well? Uh, yes and no. I mean, clearly. Uh, the the reduction you know refuse reduce etc etc think twice <laughs> before you buy anything i think this applies to us you know we've we've already damaged the planet I completely and agree. i think our ecological footprint has 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 uh, 
significantly exceeded our allowance. You know, uh, I think, you know, by the time we're 10 years old, I think we've used up our allowance for the rest of the year. Right? Yeah, yeah. They, they, make this, they make this calculation now that, uh, that every day in the year where we, have, where we have used as much resources as their I think we reached that point in, in July this year. Uh, in the case, yeah, I think in the world, maybe it's July. Mm -hmm. Europe, it's May. Mm -hmm. And then you have my country, my, my, my first or second home country, Denmark. Unfortunately, they, they use up their resources in, I believe it's in March, along with Luxembourg. <laughs> and why so? Although Denmark, you know, they score high on across the board, but then they have a, a very large, I mean, disproportionately large swine industry. Mm -hmm. And that swine industry has completely tilted uh, the equation right. uh, of, of Denmark and their ecological footprint. I didn't if you know. take that, uh, that away, then Denmark would probably have sufficient resources to last the entire year. <laughs> um, okay. So, but, so that's us, right? You know, we, we've already damaged the planet and, and clearly we have to change. We have a moral responsibility to change much faster than others. Let's talk about the, the rest of the people. Uh, that's another how many billions, right? Mm -hmm, exactly. Three or four or five billion people who aspire to, uh, to live uh, partially uh, or, yeah, they aspire to achieving and obtaining a fraction of what, we've, uh, of what we have today. And unfortunately, the world is, is not fair and is not equal, and we know that. So it, for them, I, I would say the onus is on suppliers, vendors, and the supply chain to change. Because if everybody... I was just reading an article about air conditioning units in India. Mm -hmm. India. Mm -hmm. Apparently, there are only, according to that article, don't quote me, but uh, uh, something like 20, 30 million air conditioning units today in operation in India. That's nothing compared to the one billion or so air conditioning units that they know they will need to supply over the coming years. Likewise, in Europe, Europe has the lowest AC penetration rate in the world, but that is now going to change because of the heat waves, right? And those heat waves are making life very uncomfortable, maybe only five days a year or 10 days a year. But people are complaining and some people are dying as well because of those heat waves. Back to climate change. So how do we make... How do we reduce the ecological footprint of future generations or current generations who want to jump the bandwagon of, of consumerism? And I think really it's about changing our ways and production uh, cycles. A lot of what we buy today and sell is not sustainable on so many counts, from extraction to manufacturing to transportation, short lifespan and then disposal. It's like fail, 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 fail across yes. the board, right? How do we turn that into pass, 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 and then eventually cradle to cradle? So I think this is where we have to be different in our thinking, innovation. How do we make those TVs that are going to last longer and they don't have to be chucked out? How do we make the fridge last 10 years, not two and a half years? How do we build future cars? Or how do we think mobility in such a way that we don't need to get rid of it? It's not disposable. We need to somehow uh, conceive a world where uh, consumables are not disposables. And uh, there are many examples of, of what I'm saying, but we need to literally see an exponential growth in that. And today, you know, the world is very much about linear thinking, you know, two plus two, uh, more, uh, more Wi-Fi, more of this, more cars, more, more, more. Whereas the world is really changing exponentially. And I think, uh, and I think countries in Africa, and I can cite so many examples, they don't, they don't need to think linearly anymore. We've, we did that, right? And we did all those mistakes. If they just think exponentially, they can literally skip all the bad and go straight to the good. For example, many people in Africa will uh, never own a car. They go straight to ride sharing, mm -hmm. right? Exactly. We had to go through so many steps and hurdles to reach ride sharing and car yeah, sharing. Yeah. Um, uh, many people in Africa will uh, never saw a landline, never. Mm -hmm. And they jump straight to 3G mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. and so on and so forth, right? And, and this is how the world is moving. And so we need to 
We need to grab these opportunities and make it happen for them. And renewable energy is it's, it's a no-brainer. Renewable energy can change the face of India and right. Africa and right. so many right. countries. Right. I, I also think that, especially in this area, although the dust, uh, I always hear the dust is such a big issue yep. on, the, on the panels. I don't know, I don't know how, how... Fortunately, how we have about. a lot of sun to make up for that, but we need yeah. to clean the panels. Yeah. So yeah. that's specific to Dubai. Yeah. You don't need to yeah. clean your modules in Germany or yeah. in Scotland because the rain will take care of it. <laughs> what's, what's, what's your latest take on, on uh, nuclear power? Because there's, it, it's it's been a strong discussion. I don't know whether you saw the Bill Gates documentary where he's very engaged in, in a new technology in this and all of that. I don't know. Yeah, I, I read. I read about it. And, you know, there are two schools. Uh, some people argue nuclear is good today because it is clean, i.e. it doesn't contribute to emissions, greenhouse gas emissions. So you can, you can churn out all those gigawatt hour of electricity with zero emission, mm -hmm. which no other technology can claim. I mean, solar comes close, but even solar, you need to, you know, you need to, uh, uh, to manufacture all these exactly. modules, CSP, etc., etc. So, yes, it's good when it comes to carbon footprint, but you've got the big but. Mm -hmm. If something goes wrong, it, it's dramatically wrong. And at some point, you need to dismantle, decommission those power plants, nuclear power plants, as you have in Germany. And you started doing that uh, since 10 years, I believe, and you're mm -hmm. going to phase them all out. Mm -hmm. And then you have, you're left with thousands of tons of highly, highly radioactive waste, which you need to hide somewhere for the next 5,000 years. Yeah. So you need to find that somewhere, uh, somewhere bur uh, buried beneath, uh, beneath the soil. And, and clearly, these are monumental challenges which we haven't yeah, resolved. I have the same feeling. Uh, I have the same feeling. So France is is very still very high on nuclear. Seventy five percent of electricity production in France is nuclear, which has zero carbon emission. And so far, they've had they have a clean track record. But as I said, they have thousands and thousands of radioactive tons of radioactive waste that they have to uh, uh, conceal and they have to neutralize somewhere. So versus versus, OK, let's dig more coal, let's do more of you know, natural gas or let's shift, let's transition to a low carbon economy, which is very much driven today by solar. But now we're looking looking at CSP. Hydro has always been there, but hydro is proving more and more difficult because of climate change. Yes. And so the reservoirs are fluctuating, the water levels are fluctuating, and hydro is very expensive, you know, mm -hmm. capex I is know, extremely... Yeah, unfortunately, it, makes, extremely it, it appears to make so much sense, but then... It does for countries that have a lot of running water. Yes. But then you also have geopolitical forces and conflicts, you know, Ethiopia, Egypt, etc. Uh, they need to resolve their water differences as well. So I, I think there is no... In conclusion, I would say there is no magic recipe, magic wand. No. You know, uh, we have we need a good, meaningful, sustainable energy mix. Uh, clearly, we have to phase out and decommission all the dirty fuels. The sooner, the better. The world cannot wait anymore. I think time's up, as people say. We have mm -hmm. till 2030 to cut our emissions by 50%. Yes. And then the renewables have to uh, continue to grow exponentially. And nuclear is very much country specific. Many countries cannot afford to go nuclear, will not have the know-how, uh, will not have the, 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 the investment capabilities to go nuclear. But can we phase out nuclear? I really don't know. Mm, I'm, I'm not sure either. And, 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 and nuclear, I think the conversation with Bill Gates and others is to, how do you make smaller reactors, you know? How can you go, like, you know, CSP, concentrated solar power, how can you have small scale CSP? How can you have small nuclear uh, yeah, reactors. not quite as dangerous. I mean, as, as it appears in this documentary, it, it yeah. even says that uh, supposedly we could use up, we could use up um, the, um, uh, we could use up the uh, the, the garbage of of, um, of the nuclear uh, power plants that has been produced so far as a new power source because the way it's been. Well, I leave that to the physicist. Yeah, yeah so do I. I don't yeah, there know. Might be, That's there might what they be. say in the documentary. What do I know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there might be some... There will be breakthroughs. Um, but I think we're still better off with, so uh, with small-scale distributed solar, CSP, hydro, wind, etc. Wind, I mean, has been so fantastic. The journey of wind in some countries, such as India, Germany, and Denmark. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think these are the countries leading the wind energy industry. Uh, but they too have ecological impacts. We know that, you know, mm -hmm. on, the, on the landscape, you have the noise, you have the birds. Uh, mm. So 
again, there is no magic solution, I think, yeah. but many solutions can come together to be to create a more sustainable world. No, I agree. You know, I, I always say, I think that it feels like the games have just begun, you know, and uh, and and everybody agrees now since Greta Thunberg that uh, that something needs to be done or everybody is, 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 far, is completely wrong, but still more and more people are now, yeah. you know, being aware of it. And uh, and I don't think that uh, when when you start with innovation, you will immediately reach the perf the, the the state of perfectionism. You know, you will you will definitely have to go through different phases, and uh, and you will probably go on wrong tracks as well. I mean, I yeah, yeah. And 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 this city is exactly what you said. Uh, we did as much as we could as planners and engineers. And then we built it, and then it's you know things changed a little bit. You know the needs. We've we've done a lot of small retrofits. It's a young city. It's a new city, and yet we've retrofitted several infrastructure items and components to make them more functional, more sustainable. And um, and I think we need to we need to always build that flexibility into urban planning and future cities. You know we we can be future ready, but we don't know everything. Right. Mm. So being future ready, which is, you know, a trend today, I'm future ready, I'm, I'm climate proof, etc. I think we always have to have that door open for innovation, uh, opportunity. Um, and that will make cities, I believe, more attractive and more sustainable. Absolutely. So maybe one last question. I would. I, I can sense you're really a strong uh, promoter of your life, and I'm. And I'm. I'm a promoter myself. So I, I. really hope that you know the message gets across. I'm. I'm so glad we're we're talking. Um, so I, I realize you are also very much uh, acquainted with um, with a difference in region, uh, regional problems, since I'm coming from Europe. What is your was your strongest view? I mean, as you you already mentioned that we are dealing more with the fact that we have established systems that we now have to change, which uh, we all know uh, a running system is uh, something, you know, it's like a tank ship where you can change, you know, you can uh, steer the rudder, but we have it, to pivot. it'll take a long time until it goes another, another way. And this, this is how I feel with a lot of technology and, and with a lot of marketing, by the way, as well, about how are things being communicated? How do people perceive the idea of, of, of a sustainability change in, in society? It's, uh, it's still not out there. People think of everybody, somebody talks about it in Europe, people think of greenwashing or, you know, it's a... It's skeptics. All, yeah, skeptics. Yeah. It's all yeah. a big joke, you know, where, where is this all going? And I, I would say, you know, well, I think every little step and every try and every, you know, everything is, is good, you know, if, if you ask me. Um, although then there's also a quarrel about the right strategy and, you know, and it's, it's, you know, it's still a long way. But what, what's your personal or what's your view on, I, I feel that you, you, you've, you've gathered a lot, of, a lot of knowledge about Europe and where do you think, what, what, what's the, I mean, you're, you're having meetings with Bosch and Siemens, so why do they come here? What's, what's, <laughs> what, what are you telling them? Well, clearly they see a, a business opportunity here, but also many of them want to associate their names with something like a sustainable community. So this is, as I said, it's a living lab for us. It can be a living lab for those multi-billion dollar industries and companies in the world. You know, those, those companies that, that you mentioned and others are so big, you know, they're bigger than, than some countries, you know, in terms of volume and workforce and, and, and uh, economic uh, influence. And so that, that's why they come to Sustainable City and uh, because they, they see opportunity, which, which is only good because we need those big players to accelerate the transition. Okay, okay. they want to invest the technology here. But what can we learn in Europe from, yeah. from, from you guys? Well, I, I think we have to, well, globally, I mean, I would say uh, absolutely that, you know, all the many problems came from Europe, right, in terms of uh, capitalism and, and uh, consumerism. Uh, consumerism didn't come from China, right? It, it didn't come from India. It came from the West, you know, if we agree what the West is. But that's, that's, that's a fact and that's behind us. Today, I think we need to agree that sustainability is not rocket science. It's not. It's not like I have a choice. Today, I want to be sustainable, but tomorrow, ah, it doesn't work in my schedule. Right? No, I mean, sustainability is not rocket science, it's a way of life. It's a, uh, it's a choice that you make and that's it, you chart a course and then you follow it. And I think it's important to say that sustainability should not diminish the quality of life. So it's not, it's not about, you know, hugging trees. I, 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 I like to hug trees, but it's, it's not about tree hugging. It's about uh, changing your ways without compromising the quality. 
and uh, and you have choices to make every single day about so how many the basics uh, Greta Thunberg I'm sure she would she would agree with that you know she doesn't want to fly well you and I need to think how many times do we fly a year and can I avoid it can I and I and I just did actually I just canceled one of my speaking engagements in California because I thought traveling 16 hours one way and then 32 hours round trip my carbon footprint would have been two we calculated 2.2 tons of CO2 equivalent just to go and speak somewhere. So instead, we did a nice production, video production, we sent it to them. And I, I saved time and money and carbon, etc. So we need to think about our travel, necessary versus non-essential. Meat, I mean, I'm not saying we, we have to go vegan and we have to be vegetarian, but how many times do you eat meat in a week? If you like to eat meat, well, perhaps and you're, today you have it three times a week. Well, is your life okay if you eat meat only once a week, maybe once every two weeks? You will make a big favor to the planet. Uh, take your car. What car do you drive? Do you absolutely need to own your own car? Or do you now live in a society, in a community where all the alternatives are affordable and at your fingertip? Um, your house. How big is your house? Do you, do you have to live in a big house? Can you downsize? Downsizing is, is also good for the planet. It really depends on need. And you maintain the same quality of life. So I think we have so many choices to make. And it's not about today, you know, the West teaching the East or the South teaching the North or vice versa. I think it's a conversation we must have. And we should be honest with ourselves. And we need to recognize um, the rights of underprivileged people, marginalized uh, people, communities and societies in the, in the world. And if we want them, if we want them to behave in such a way, in a better way towards the environment, well, we need to make sure that they have the means to do so. So I think it befalls us, you know, in the West and maybe in the, in the GCC and in Dubai uh, to facilitate this transition and this, this, this pivot. How do we go from unsustainable to sustainable? Uh, so it is a, a global responsibility, but you and I need to think about it very individually, very selfishly. How can I be more sustainable tomorrow, today? I think that is a good closing word. I would not, <laughs> I would not like to add anything to that. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Karen. Thank you for Thank coming. You. I, I you hope we, we will see more people from Germany, ideas from Germany. And, uh, well, and again, this is a two-way street, you know, and... Uh, Yes, yes. And the conversation is, is ongoing. I'm, I'm experiencing that a lot. So we're going to resume this tonight with Siemens. Let's see yeah. what they have. <laughs> I, I wish you all the luck. <laughs> Thank you very much for Thank, coming. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Okay. I hope you found this inspiring. It certainly was for me. And we hope it will be for others as well. So please follow us uh, and our podcast and follow our story on our social media channels. We are on, we are on YouTube as well. But um, certainly you can recommend us to your friends as well if you think that some of these thoughts were worth sharing. We certainly hope so and we will continue to do some more interviews. Uh, so thanks to you all and talk soon. <laughs>